Constanze, Constanze, and he will be demonstrating conduit, conduit uh, lecture <coughs> pedagogy, an emerging model of instruction <coughs> in postgraduate science. <coughs> Sorry. In postgraduate science departments worldwide, and uh, he will briefly discuss CLP and deliver a quantum physics lecture. He has been uh, instructing for several years at MIT, Columbia, and NIU, part of an introductory course um, he leads instead of professors who, have, who, who do not have the time to devote uh, to entire level instruction. Albeit, oh God, crazy words, uh, in very advanced programs. As a CLP instructor, uh, Costanzi delivers several classes worth of um, these in introductory courses, although he was not himself formally trained in physics or biology. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to write such a formal uh, introduction, uh, but basically, uh, so I'm a conduit lecturer at a few institutions, mostly at MIT, but this year I started um, also at Columbia and NYU. And the basic idea is that, wait, hold on, are any of you familiar with relativistic quantum physics? Yes? Yes? Okay, well then, dang, now I'm going to have to be, <laughs> I'm going to have to be accurate. <laughs> Um, I'm not, and I, I, I was, uh, for a while I was teaching math, uh, like upper level mathematics on the high school level, but basically I was hired at, um, uh, at MIT, or I joined the program, to be a conduit between Professor Alan Guff, who originated this lecture, uh, and the students there, because uh, Professor Alan Guff spends basically all of his time at CERN, and so just can't come back to teach the class. And they don't want to do it by Skype, and they don't want to video it. Um, and in fact, like basically anyone who's qualified to teach that course is gone. It, like, is, is like working on their own research. So, so the, the way that they're, like I said, an emerging form of pedagogy is I've learned half of the semester, which is why I get to be here. And then um, I deliver it on a weekly basis um, in the classroom. So I'm not 100% sure what it is I'm saying, um, which is amusing sometimes, because I'll like, if I mess up, so if I mess up, uh, you guys don't laugh, because <laughs> there was once where, I don't know, I, I would mess up and everyone who was following along was able to tell. Um, but basically, I deliver it like a, like a, I don't know. I've only done this once for like non-physics students at an educational conference. So I'll, I'll, I won't, ordinarily I'd be like, okay, is everyone taking notes? So, but I'll just deliver it, yeah? Okay, cool. Or maybe we can talk about it later. <laughs> but uh, so this is um, the first lecture of the course Relativistic Quantum Field Theory 1. Uh, quantization of the free scalar field, which is <laughs> no, no sweat, no sweat. <laughs> um, which is uh, yeah. So it's it's like the very first course of the semester, and then as soon as next semester starts, I'll be giving it again for the next batch of introductory students. So uh, without further ado, um, yeah, quantization of the free scalar field. quantization of the free scalar field. So we have used the continuum, uh, excuse me, uh, so as we've already seen, a free scalar field can be described by the Lagrangian such that L is equal to the volume integral over a real space X times script L, where script L is equal to one half uh, the covariant derivative of phi, uh, contravariant derivative of phi minus one half M squared phi squared, which is equal to, equal to one half 
uh, phi dot squared minus one half the gradient of phi times the gradient of phi uh, minus one half m squared phi squared. Now our goal is to quantize this theory in the sense of developing a quantum theory which corresponds to the classical theory described by the above Lagrangian. So here we will use the method of canonical quantization, which I assume is already familiar to you in the context of quantum mechanics. Uh, specifically, uh, suppose we were given a Lagrangian with a discrete number of variables q sub i, such that l is equal to l of q sub i, q dot sub i, and t. Uh, a, uh, uh, a, classical, a quantum theory corresponding to the classical theory could then be constructed by promoting each p sub i and q sub i to an operator, such that the uh, the canonical momentum, p sub i, is equal to, or excuse me, defined as the partial derivative of L with respect to q dot uh, sub i, and the Hamiltonian is equal to h, is h is equal to the sum over all i times p sub i q dot sub i minus L. Now, uh, quantum theory corresponding to the classical theory could be constructed by promoting each uh, p sub i and q sub i to an operator on a Hilbert space and insisting on the canonical commutation relations, the commutator of q sub i and p sub j is equal to i h bar uh, uh, times uh, delta i j. Uh, so for most of the course, we will use units for which h bar is equal to 1, but for now, I will leave the h bars in the equations. Uh, the Hamiltonian uh, H of P sub i and Q sub i is then also an operator on Hilbert space. And in the uh, Schrodinger picture, the physical states evolve according to the Schrodinger equation such that I H bar times the partial derivative with respect to time of the wave function is equal to the Hamiltonian H times the wave function ket. Now, if H is independent of time, then equation 7 has the formal solution uh, with a ket of phi t is equal to e to the minus i h t over h bar times the wave function at time zero. Uh, this, uh, given any operator script O, its expectation value in the state phi of t can then be given as, in bra ket notation, uh, phi of t operator script O to the ket of phi of t is equal to a bra of phi zero, uh, e to the i h t over h bar, uh, times operator script O times e to the minus i h t over h bar with a ket of phi zero. Now this equation leads naturally to the Heisenberg picture description in which the physical states are all treated as time independent and the time dependence is incorporated into the evolution of the operators such that uh, operator script O as a function of time is equal to e to the i h t over h bar um, operator script O e to the minus i h t over h bar. So to quantize the, uh, uh, field, the classical theory of equation two, we can begin by quantizing a lattice version of the theory. That is, we can replace the continuous space with a cubic lattice of closely spaced grid points with a lattice spacing of A, and we can truncate the space to a finite region. Uh, then if we can take the limit as the lattice spacing A approaches zero and the volume approaches infinity, then the quantization of the field theory can be completed. Now we will see later that the A approaches zero limit is uh, problematic for interacting theories, but we will see here that the program can be carried out easily for the free theory. Uh, so when we replace the uh, continuous space with a finite lattice of points, we can label each lattice site with an index k. Uh, in a fully detailed lattice description, the, uh, we would probably label each lattice site with a triplet of integers representing the x, y, and z coordinates of the site. But for present purposes, it will suffice to imagine simply numbering all the lattice sites from 1 to n, where n is the total number of sites. Uh, the field operator, phi of the position vector x and t, is then replaced by a set of dynamical variables, phi sub k of t, where one can think of phi sub k of t as representing the average value 
of phi at the position vector x and t in a cube of size a surrounding the lattice site k. Uh, the Lagrangian of equations 1 and 2 is then replaced by uh, L is equal to the sum over all k times script L sub k times delta v, where delta v is equal to a cubed and uh, script L sub k, script L sub k is equal to um, equal to one half uh, phi dot sub k squared minus one half the gradient of phi sub k times the gradient of phi sub k minus one half m squared phi sub k squared. Uh, where uh, the uh, lattice derivative, uh, the gradient of phi sub k, is defined as phi sub k prime of k and i minus phi sub k all over a. Uh, so the uh, canonical momenta um, p sub k would then be given as the partial derivative of L with respect to uh, phi dot sub k, which is equal to the partial derivative of script L sub k with respect to phi dot sub k minus, uh, excuse me, times delta v, uh, which is equal to phi dot sub k times delta v. Now since uh, the canonical momenta are proportional to delta v, it's natural to define uh, the canonical momentum density pi sub k, pi sub k, to define it as uh, p sub k over delta v, which is equal to the partial derivative of script L sub k with respect to phi dot sub k, which is equal to phi dot sub k. Uh, following equation 5, the Hamiltonian H, Hamiltonian H uh, is equal to the sum over all k uh, times uh, p sub k phi dot sub k minus L, which is equal to the sum over all k times the quantity pi sub k phi dot sub k minus script L sub k all times delta v. Um, the canonical momentum, uh, excuse me, the canonical commutation relations are then uh, the commutator of phi sub k prime and phi sub k is equal to zero. Uh, the commutator of p sub k prime and p sub k is equal to zero. And the uh, commutator of phi sub k prime and p sub k is equal to i h bar delta sub k prime k. Uh, in terms of the canonical momentum density, uh, the commutator of phi sub k prime and uh, phi sub k is equal to zero. The commutator of pi sub k prime and pi sub k is equal to zero. And the commutator of phi sub k prime and pi sub k is equal to i h bar delta sub k prime k all over delta v. Now, while we have not yet constructed the full theory, it is not too early to write down the continuum limit of these defining equations. Um, so the continuum canonical momentum uh, density uh, right here, uh, pi, of vector x in t is equal to the partial derivative of script L with respect to phi dot of uh, vector x in t, which is equal to phi dot of vector x in t. Uh, the Hamiltonian H is then equal to uh, the, excuse me, the volume integral over a real space x times the quantity pi phi dot minus script L. And uh, the trivial canonical commutation relations carry over trivially such that the commutator of phi at the position vector x prime in t and uh, phi at the position vector x in t is equal to zero. And the commutator of pi of the position vector x prime in t and pi of the position vector x in t is equal to zero, obviously. If the, uh, for the non-trivial commutation relation, the result will be clearest if we first rewrite the last equation in line 19 as a sum, as a sum which will become an integral in the limit. So. Uh, uh, if we let script R denote a region in the lattice, the last equation in line 19 becomes the sum over all k as an element within the region script R of the commutator of pi sub k prime and pi sub k, pi sub k uh, times delta v, which is equal to i h bar times the sum over all k as an element within the region script R times delta sub k prime k, which is equal to i h bar and 1 if k prime exists within the region script R and zero otherwise. So in the continuum limit, uh, the sum over all k, well, let me rewrite it, the sum over all k is an element within the region script R of phi sub k prime and pi sub k times delta v clearly approaches uh, the integral over all space within the region script R of the commutator of phi of the position vector x prime and t and pi of the position vector x and t 
Uh, so equation 23 can be rewritten as the volume integral over all space within the region script R of the commutator of phi of the position vector x prime and t and pi of the position vector x and t, which is equal to i h bar and 1 uh, if x prime, excuse me, vector x prime exists within the region script R and 0 otherwise. Um, now this relation can be expressed more conveniently by int introducing the Dirac delta function, uh, delta cubed of vector x, which is defined by its integral such that the volume integral over all space within the region this is an R. Uh, you should have that. Uh, within the region of uh, f of vector x times the delta function of x minus x prime. Uh, is defined as uh, f of vector x prime if x prime exists within the region script R and 0 otherwise. Given this definition, um, uh, equation 24 becomes the commutator of phi of the position vector x prime and t, and pi of the position vector x and t is equal to i h bar delta of x minus x prime. Note that uh, the delta function is symmetric, so delta of x minus x prime is equal to delta of x prime minus x. Note that one often thinks of the Dirac delta function as uh, the limit of a sequence of functions which each um, integrate to 1 but become more and more sharply peaked as x approaches 0. Uh, this result is useful, for, excuse me, this approach is useful for intuition, but it is not mathematically rigorous. Uh, it can be shown that there exists no function with the properties ascribed to the Dirac delta function. The, del the Dirac delta function is actually a distribution, not a function. Uh, the bottom line, however, is that uh, the delta function can be, uh, can be defined and the definition of an integral suitably generally generalized so that equation 25 becomes exactly true by definition. Uh, we will soon see that each Fourier component of a scalar field obeys the equations of a harmonic oscillator, so it's useful to review uh, the quantum mechanics of a harmonic oscillator before we proceed. Uh, so consider the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian for a uh, simple harmonic oscillator which can be uh, written as L is equal to 1 half Q dot squared minus 1 half omega squared Q squared, where uh, we have adopted units for which the mass M of the harmonic oscillator is 1. Uh, the canonical momentum, uh, P, is equal to uh, the partial derivative of L with respect to Q dot, which is equal to Q dot. Um, and the Hamiltonian H is equal to P Q dot minus L, uh, which is equal to 1 half P squared plus uh, 1 half omega squared Q squared. Um, and the canonical uh, commutation relation is the commutator of Q and P is equal to I H bar. Now we can define creation and annihilation operators such that uh, A is equal to the square root of omega over 2 H bar times Q plus I over 2 H bar omega times P. And a dagger is equal to the square root of omega over 2 H bar times Q minus I over 2 H bar omega times p, so that the commutator of a and a dagger is equal to 1. Uh, the Hamiltonian h can be rewritten as uh, h bar omega times the quantity a dagger times a plus 1 half. And the commutator of h with the creation and annihilation operators are the commutator of h and a dagger is equal to h bar omega a dagger and the commutator of h, oops, excuse me, the commutator of h and a is equal to minus h bar omega a, from which it follows that the result of applying a dagger to an eigenstate of h is to produce an eigenstate of h with an eigenvalue higher than the original by h bar omega, while a acts on an eigenstate of h to lower the eigenvalue by h bar omega. The ground state of h, uh, uh, yes, therefore satisfies a acting on the zero vector 
is equal to zero, uh, while the normalized nth excited state can be written as the n ket is equal to uh, one over the square root of n factorial times a dagger to the nth power times the n ket, um, where the uh, eigenvalue or energy uh, e sub n is equal to the quantity n plus excuse me, it's an n plus one half times h bar omega. Uh, the, uh, the equations in line thirty one can be uh, solved for q and p, uh, giving a q is equal to uh, the square root of h bar over 2 omega times the quantity a plus a dagger. And p is equal to minus i times the square root of h bar omega over 2 times the quantity a minus a dagger. Now, so in the Heisenberg picture description, uh, q of t now, q of t, is equal to uh, e to the i h t over h bar, q e to the minus i h t over h bar, um, which is equal to the square root of h bar over 2 omega times e to the i h t over h bar, uh, a times the quantity a plus a dagger times e to the minus i h t over h bar, uh, which is equal to uh, the square root of h bar over 2 omega times the quantity a times e to the minus i omega t plus a dagger times e to the i omega t. And p of t, uh, p of t, is equal to minus i times the square root of h bar omega over 2 uh, times the quantity a times e to the minus i omega t minus a dagger times e to the i omega t. Have used, uh, sorry, we have used the continuum limit of uh, the lattice version of the theory to obtain the key results that, uh, excuse me, that uh, pi of the position vector x and t is equal to the partial derivative of the script L with respect to phi dot of the position vector x and t, which is equal to phi dot of the position vector x and t. Uh, that the Hamiltonian H is equal to the volume integral over a real space x times the quantity pi phi dot minus script L. Uh, that the commutator of phi of the position vector x prime and t and phi of the position vector x and t is equal to zero, and the commutator of pi of the position vector x prime and t and pi of the position vector x and t is equal to zero, and the commutator of phi of the position vector x prime and t and pi of the position vector x and t is equal to i h bar delta of x minus x prime. Having done this, we can now proceed with the continuum theory directly. Now we view phi of the position vector x and t as a uh, collection of dynamical variables in the classical theory, which we have promoted to operators in the quantum theory, exactly as we did in the discrete system in section one. Usually we have it all, so I point it. Uh, um, uh, we can now use the Fourier transform to uh, identify convenient linear combinations of these operators such that phi twiddle of vector k and t is defined as uh, the volume integral over a real space x times e to the minus i vector k dot vector x times phi of the position vector x and t. And pi twiddle, pi twiddle will def of vector k and t will define as the volume integral over a real space x times e to the minus i vector k dot vector x times pi of vector x and t, so that the Fourier inversion theorem implies that uh, phi of the position vector x and t is equal to the volume integral over k space, 1 over 2 pi cubed times e to the i vector uh, k dot vector x times phi twiddle of vector k and t. And uh, pi of vector x and t is equal to the volume integral over k space, 1 over 2 pi cubed times e to the i vector k dot vector x 
times pi twiddle of vector k and t. Now, the fact that phi of the position vector x and t is a real classical variable and hence a Hermitian quantum operator implies that implies that uh, phi uh, twiddle of minus vector k and t is equal to um, phi dagger of vector k and t with a similar relation for, for pi of vector k and t. Um, the, uh, 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 the Heisenberg equations of motion for phi of the position vector x and t are the same as the classical equations of motion such that uh, the second partial of phi with respect to time minus grad squared phi plus m squared phi is equal to zero. And we should keep in mind that since we have not yet set h bar to one, that m in this equation has units of an inverse length and not a mass. Uh, equation 46 implies that the Fourier transform field obeys the second partial uh, of phi twiddle with respect to time of the uh, of vector k and t plus the quantity vector k squared plus m squared times phi twiddle of vector k and t is equal to zero. Uh, the general solution to this equation can be written as uh, phi twiddle of vector k and t is equal to phi sub 1 of vector k times e to the minus i omega sub pt uh, plus uh, phi sub 2 of vector k times e to the i omega sub pt, where omega sub p uh, omega sub p is equal to the square root of the quantity vector k squared plus m squared. Now the reality condition of equation 45 implies that uh, phi sub 2 of vector k is equal to phi sub 1 dagger of minus vector k. So uh, phi twiddle of vector k and t is equal to um, uh, oh, phi sub 1 of vector k times e to the minus i omega sub pt plus phi sub 1 dagger of minus vector k times e to the i omega sub pt. And then the relation that pi is equal to phi dot then implies that uh, pi twiddle of vector k and t is equal to minus i omega sub p phi sub 1 uh, of vector k times e to the minus i omega sub p t plus uh, i omega sub p phi sub 1 dagger of minus vector k times e to the i omega sub p t. And then equations 51 and 52 can be solved simultaneously to give an expression for phi sub 1 of vector k, which is equal to uh, one half the quantity phi twiddle of vector k and t plus i over omega sub p times pi twiddle of vector k and t um, all times e to the i omega sub p t uh, which is equal to one half the volume integral in a real space x times e to the minus i times the quantity vector k dot vector x minus omega sub p t all times the quantity phi of the position vector x and t plus i over omega sub p times pi of vector x and t, where the second line was obtained by using equations uh, 41 and 42. Note uh, that although the second line contains, or excuse me, the right-hand side contains quantities that depend explicitly on t, uh, equations 51 and 52 guarantee that the full expression is independent of time. Now, by comparing with e equation 31, one sees that phi sub one, phi sub one, this is a one, of vector k uh, bears some resemblance to an annihilation operator. To test this hypothesis, uh, we can compute the commutator of phi sub one of vector k and phi sub one of vector q, and also the. Uh, we can compute the commutator of phi sub one of vector k and phi sub one of vector q and the commutator of phi sub 1 of vector k and the phi, phi sub 1 dagger of vector q. So using equation 53 and the canonical commutation relations, uh, the commutator of phi sub 1 of vector k and phi sub 1 of vector q is equal to 1 fourth the volume integral in a real space x, volume integral in a real space y, times e to the minus i times the quantity vector k dot vector x minus <laughs> omega sub kt, times e to the minus i times the quantity vector q dot vector y minus omega sub q, t all times the commutator of phi of the position vector x and t 
plus i over omega sub k times pi of vector x and t and phi of the position vector y and t uh, plus i over omega sub q times pi of the position vector y and t which is equal to 1 fourth the volume integral in a real space x, volume integral in a real space y times e to the minus i times the quantity vector q dot vector y minus omega sub q t all times e uh, to the minus i times the quantity vector q dot vector y minus omega sub q t all times the quantity um, i over omega sub q i h bar delta function of vector x minus vector y minus i over omega sub k i h bar delta function of vector x minus vector y uh, which is equal to h bar over 4 times the volume integral over a real space x times e to the minus i times the quantity note the sub quantity vector k plus vector q uh, dot vector x minus sub quantity omega sub k plus omega sub q t all times the quantity 1 over omega sub k minus 1 over omega sub q. We now use the identity uh, that the volume integral over a real space x times e to the minus i times the quantity uh, vector k plus vector q dot vector x is equal to 2 pi cubed uh, times the delta function of vector k plus vector q, which implies that the only possible non-zero contribution to equation 54 arises when vector q is equal to minus vector k, in which case the factor in the curly brackets vanishes. Thus, uh, the commutator of phi sub 1 of vector k and phi sub 1 of vector q is equal to 0, as we would expect if phi sub 1 of vector k was proportional to an annihilation operator. So using the same techniques, we can now compute uh, the commutator of phi sub 1 of vector k and phi sub 1 dagger of vector q. Uh, which is equal to uh, 1 fourth the volume integral in a real space x, volume integral in a real space y, times e to the minus i times the quantity, uh, excuse me, vector k dot vector x minus omega sub k t times e to the minus i times the quantity vector q dot vector y dot vector y minus omega sub q t, all times the commutator of phi of the position vector x and t plus i over omega sub q times pi of the position vector x and t and phi of the position vector y and t minus i over omega sub k times pi of the position vector x, or excuse me, y and t, which is equal to 1 fourth the volume integral in a real space x, volume integral in a real space y times e to the minus i times the quantity vector k dot vector x minus omega sub k t times e to the i, excuse me, this is i, just not minus i, times the quantity vector q dot vector y minus omega sub q t all times the quantity minus i over omega sub, uh, excuse me, omega sub q, i h bar delta function of uh, vector x minus vector y minus i over omega sub k, i h bar delta function of vector x minus vector y, uh, which is equal to h bar over 4 times the volume integral in a real space x times e to the minus i times the quantity. The subquantity is vector k minus vector q dot vector x minus subquantity omega sub k minus omega sub q t all times the quantity 1 over omega sub k plus 1 over omega sub q which is equal to h bar over 4 times 2 pi cubed times the delta function of vector k minus vector q um, times 2 over omega sub k sub k which is equal to h bar over 2 omega sub k um, times 2 pi cubed times the delta function of vector k minus vector q. So the standard continuum definition of an annihilation operator is then given by uh, a of vector k is equal to the square root of 2 omega sub k over h bar times phi sub 1 of vector k. So that the commutator the commutator of a of vector k and a of vector q is equal to zero. And the commutator of a of vector k and a dagger of vector q is equal to 2 pi cubed times the delta function 
of vector k minus vector q. We're using equations uh, 43, 51, and 58, the field operator via the position vector x and t can now be um, expressed in terms of creation and annihilation operators uh, such that such that uh, well, let me do this. such that uh, phi of the position vector x and t is equal to uh, the volume integral over k space 1 over 2 pi cubed times the square root of h bar over 2 omega sub k uh, all times the quantity a of vector k um, times e to the i times the quantity of vector k dot vector x minus omega sub kt uh, plus a dagger of vector k times e to the minus i times the quantity of vector k dot vector x minus omega sub kt. Uh, hmm. uh, note that in the second term, I have uh, changed the variables of integration from k to minus k to write in the form shown. Uh, the um, continuum canonical momentum density, pi of vector x and t, which is equal to phi dot of vector x and t, is equal to minus, uh, minus i times uh, the volume integral over k space, uh, 1 over 2 pi cubed, times the square root of h bar omega sub k over 2, times the quantity a of vector k times e to the i times the quantity vector k dot vector x minus omega sub kt um, minus a dagger of vector k times e to the minus i times the quantity vector k dot vector x minus omega sub kt. Finally, uh, it is useful to rewrite equation 53 in terms of the properly normalized annihilation operator so that we can express the annihilation operator in terms of field and canonical momentum densities, such that A of vector k is equal to uh, the square root of omega sub k over 2 h bar times the volume integral over a real space x times e to the minus i times the quantity vector k dot vector x minus omega sub pt, all times the quantity phi of the position vector x and t plus, oops, excuse me, plus i over omega sub p times pi of the position vector x and t. Now we might also want the corresponding formula for the creation operator, which is found by simply taking the adjoint of the above equation, such that uh, a dagger of vector k is equal to the square root of omega sub k over 2 h bar times the volume integral over a real space x times e to the i times the quantity vector k dot vector x minus omega sub pt times the quantity phi of the position vector x and t minus i over omega sub p times pi of the position vector x and t. So the boxed equations above are the primary results that we will continue to use throughout the course. So that's the that's the uh, that's the first uh, lecture that I would give, and that went really fast. You ordinarily, there's is like, oh, okay, do we have you know, so on and so forth, write down questions for the section and so on. So, mm -hmm. um, but it was fun to kind of barrel through it. <laughs> uh, thanks for <laughs> listening. Um, uh, <laughs> Hopefully it's a, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I did, like I said, I did it for a, a, an educational conference as well for folks who were, are you familiar with, is, because I was visiting London and it sounded like only, there's, there's a couple of conduit lecturers in Cambridge, but it's like a newer concept. Is this not a? So you're almost like a, a proxy of this. So this person Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, designs, he comes up with a lecture himself, or him or herself, yep. themselves. Yeah. Um, and then just, it gives you, so do you get like, um, like I don't want to say a script, but do you get the lesson plan? Or like, how do you receive this information? Yeah, 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 yeah. I get a, so yeah, um, that's why they call it conduit, like I'm, uh, I, I think I've referred to myself as a conduit, but yeah, we're conduits proxy, yeah. 
Um, we get a yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. We, we all all of us share one office. <laughs> um, no, I was actually I don't know maybe you guys saw me working with it because um, it was all the way at the start of the semester that I thought I had my notes. Uh, yeah, I basically get the lecture notes. Mm -hmm. I've never seen. Oh, here it is. Yeah, this is this is the first two lectures. So um, I've never seen him deliver it. I have skyped with him. Yeah. I haven't touched him yet, uh, <laughs> but Professor Alan, <laughs> Professor Alan Guff uh, gave this lecture in uh, March on March second, two thousand and eight, oh. and so then it was like, cool. This is because this is again, this is introductory level. Oh, sorry, that was lecture two. Lecture one was February sixteenth. So there's quite a bit of time between uh, between lectures yeah. that they'd be working on their own and maybe working with a grad student. Um, uh, but yeah, so I, I get it and I expel it. Yeah, basically, yeah. So how much of like what you said to us is you? Boy, every time I make a mistake, I'm supposed to like really like that wasn't that wasn't him. That was me, you know. <laughs> and I think I I, I should have said um, we will. It, there's a footnote. That is, uh, we'll return to the definition of the direct delta function later in the course. The bottom line, however, is that the delta function can be defined in a definition of an integral suitably generalized. So that, that x equation 25 is uh, exactly true by definition. So, but I don't think it would have been any, uh, any uh, it wasn't a written issue, so that would, wouldn't have been a problem. Um, other than that, oh yeah, there is, God, it always gets, he said, uh, in the lecture notes, he says, uh, what is it? The trivial canonical commutation relations carry over trivially, such that blah, 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 obviously. And, <laughs> yeah, and so I like, to, I like to say that as well, because I'm supposed okay. to. I really enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's hard to say that without being like, obviously students, you know, like, as if I know what I'm saying, so they all laugh at me too. But yeah, it's generally a, a, an amusing relation. Uh. How did you find yourself doing this job? What did you train in or? Well, uh, so I, uh, I studied theater and child psychology, and somehow that qualified me to teach mathematics <laughs> on a high school level. But then I knew um, one of the physicists at the University of Minnesota, where I'm from, or Minnesota I'm from, um, and he was working with Professor Alan Guest and was like, oh yeah, there's this guy, because they were starting up the program four years ago, five, five years ago, but then they started this lecture, or excuse me, this course uh, four years ago, and that's, they started with me. So then I got to move to New York. Hey. Yeah, 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 right? <laughs> yeah, it's almost <laughs> nice to have an excuse to leave Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. That's, so that's how. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I'm looking into, like, because the other Condis have experience in, uh, in like, microbiology. Um, they're considering adding more courses. So part of me is like, maybe I should take those on as well. Mm -hmm. um, oh, but like I said, uh, one of the nice things about um, conduit lecturing is that I can go and do this course anywhere, like here. Uh, but I, I've been doing it also at MIT, or excuse me, starting at MIT, uh, Columbia, and NYU as well. Um, so now Professor Alan Guth, who's, who, who speaks through me, can, can now be a professor of multiple uh, universities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, how um, much of this do you... Understand? Don't say understand. Okay. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. grasp of or understand the applications yeah, honestly, honestly, none of it. Like, it was, it was one of the, like, on the first time I was reading through it, it was like, pi, I know pi, it's 3.14, and so on. And they're like, that's not what that is in this context. So I do like the way that we, the way that you learn something, it's like, so there's this, right? Or I could go, like, you know, like, I could map it out. Like, it's, the, the choreography of it is like mapped out in my notes, but it's like, uh, like, so there's this, and then this 
is like these three or four other things. So we're going to take that and then we're going to stick it into that first thing. So like, for instance, this here came from earlier, but then this relation informs, uh, for instance, this. So like I'll notice some of the symbols and I'll like use those patterns to remember it all. Um, but as far as like this entire lecture apparently is very introductory, like, like almost like, you know, everyone's kind of nodding along. And I think it all summarizes into like A, like the, this uh, A of K and A dagger of K show up in the second lecture as like one thing among many, you know what I'm saying? And so it like progresses. So I notice, so what I understand isn't so much what it all refers to, but maybe how they relate to one another. But that's more just for my job. So it's you understand it, the internal logic of what you're yeah, saying, but yeah, yeah. its place in the world. Yeah, yeah. I like to think about it as choreographic. Yeah. Um, but but from what I understand, when I ask, it's like this is the fabric of time space. Well, that's what it sounded like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and so I'll take their word for it. But I don't particularly. But wasn't A like you know as A approaches? Wasn't that the uh, when you do the the sum? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like the size of the quanta, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. quantum, or whatever of space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think so. Okay, this is not direct. This is not. This is not me again. But now this is the students. But they say, yeah, because quantum mechanics is like these very very tiny things, and relativity is like these huge things, and the systems don't work together. Mm -hmm. um, trying to like smooth out the quanta, like you say, yeah. of time and space, time space, which is the same thing apparently, uh, helps use, helps incorporate relativity into quantum mechanics. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's what I understand. But again, like I have no idea, so, so, like, so then what? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, with your with your background in theater, yeah, um, did that? I know how that applies. I, I can see how it applies to both of you, like when you're teaching at a high school level and when you're doing this. But those are very different, like applications of of, of theater, I guess, mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and in this, I, I feel like this is more of a role for, uh, yeah. Um, there's definitely some kind of act involved, like a spectacle of, of the theater, and like you put on this role, uh, you put on this persona, and you embody that, what's his name, the pro professor? Professor Alan Guth. Professor Alan Guth. Yes. You become Professor Alan Guth, in a sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, I, I'm not trying to take on any of his mannerisms. Of course. And I guess I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be an authority over these students. Um, but a reason that conduit lecture even happen is because they want to have this person-to-person -person relation. So it helps, you know, I know the students, like names, and it's like, I can, I can, I do my best, boy, like, or especially around here, I remember, like, it's, I, 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 like, feel people checking out, and I'm trying to, like, you know, uh, da -da 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 -da. like, I feel like, uh, um, if there's anything that I bring from theater, it'd be like, you know, delivery of yeah. even like not particularly poetic. I mean, I've spent a, a few a few poetic. years with it, so I kind of like uh, approach it as poetry in a way. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Because they say don't try. Don't don't like. You're not the professor. Don't be a professor. Don't be Professor Alan Gust. Mm -hmm. um, but. I don't know, just for, just as far as delivering anything live, okay. that's been helpful. Uh, and I guess it like, almost leads me to my next question, because uh, with my very limited experience in education, mm -hmm. I, the thing that I enjoyed the most was the relationship that was built between like, teacher and student. Um, but this seems very like didactic in the sense that you're just speaking in front of a class, but you kind of touched on it that like, you kind of develop relationships with the students in the course over time. Um, so do you carry that experience of like relationship building from the classroom to like this bigger like uh, Condi realm that you live in? Or? Um, yeah, 
Yeah. Well, I see them. I see. Them, actually, I was kind of surprised to see the, the the gap between the dates because when I do it, there's it's like weekly, week and a half lead. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so so I'll see them and you know we'll talk and I'm always curious to hear like what they think of it. So in that sense, you know, there's rapport building. Yeah. Um, uh, and 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 uh, one thing that's interesting is there's this like playful, like I said, there was a time it was uh, it was um, I think I laughed to myself when I did it. There was oh no, it was on the other side. There was a a vector that wasn't supposed to be a vector, but it, what, I I put an arrow over it and everyone laughed. Like it was just this like like what did I do kind of moment. Uh, <laughs> So, so since then, I, I've like tried to approach it more playfully. Like, you know that I don't know this, so but I'm gonna know it for you. You know, or like we're all gonna not know together. Um, uh, but then, but actually, I don't. I don't really like. I said, yeah, I joke that we share an office, uh, but I don't really run into any of the other kind because they're in different um, departments. Mm. Um, yeah. Do you have like condi luncheons or you know, <laughs> happy hours? No, well, that's the thing is our our schedules don't align. So it's like, so it's like it's weird because in one room there's like four of us and it's like I am quantum mechanics, like you are microbiology, <laughs> you are we're these like spheres of knowledge that like drop off our bags and go like uh, yeah. But I think it yeah. So I don't know them very well. It's really fun. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Are there from this? So is it only in science? Or? Yeah, well, it's conduit lectures have only emerged in these very theoretical, uh, like, from what I understand, you need to devote quite a bit of your life to, like, learn this in order to be able to really know what it is. And then at that point, the level of specialization, like, Professor Alan Gupp does not want to come back and teach, you know, this like rote course, because you would do it the same way every time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's in those fields. So at MIT, it is uh, uh, my relativistic quantum field theory course. Um, there's a microbiology, and there's at, like basically astrophysics, but something more complicated than that. <laughs> but we should do like a skills sharing between all of us. And, like, <laughs> I mean, this is at the point where you like just like if you've been doing up to like pre-university physics, like this is the stuff you would have started just before you went to uni. Oh, this would be so. This would be after uni university. Oh. After probably one graduate program. Oh, right. This is like PhD level, but like, but then also like introductory to this PhD level, but right. only in the very specific relativistic quantum field. They're, like it's not taught in I think uh, many other universities huh. because it's such a specialized field. Right. Um, otherwise, I'm sure they could get just grad students to teach it. Mm -hmm. Do you think you would, <coughs> if you with this particular person, you know, you're not trying to be um, mm -hmm. as an experiment, just like team up with like a special effects makeup team? And <laughs> And be him. Yeah, he sounds cool for like, like one, you know, a group of people that have never met him or you before to see you. Like, yeah, or if I was just like I'm Professor Alan Guth. Yeah, you know, that's... I'm thirty years old and I'm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that would be one thing that I do know about him is apparently at CERN he won the messiest office award. <laughs> so, so it's hard. It's hard, and but even hearing that, it's like oh. Like, like I'm not like I'm not supposed to allow that to affect my delivery, but it's also kind of like oh I can imagine that professor you know who like yeah does that. Cool. Uh, what was your memorization process like? Um, kind of how long did it take, and what strategies did you use to yeah 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 get this all in here? Yeah, they gave me uh, basically a year to memorize, or they told me the year before that I was going to do it. Um, and it was kind of like, you have to be able to do, like, uh, like in August, either you can do it or you can't. And if you can't, then you're not hired. So it was this odd, like, yeah. high stakes, 
audition, um, where it was suddenly like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, um, wrote, wrote memorization. But like I said, like, wait, I could, I can even just show you. So for instance, like, yeah, they didn't tell me any of the patterns, and they didn't necessarily, right? Just because I'm a conduit, they don't need me to need me to know or appreciate the patterns. I think it helps me deliver it better. But for instance, every section starts out L something, P something, the H does something, something in brackets. This is this is kind of how I started. And I was like, oh, okay. It starts with a definition of the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian, another Lagrangian, and then actually in the fourth one, it repeats uh, it repeats 2021, 20, 22, and 26. So I was able to like, cool. So this Lagrangian is this. Oh, this is different. And like, so this script L sub K is this script L, <coughs> but all of these, the only difference is that there's a sub K to all of the phi's, for instance. Uh, so I was able to be like, oh, okay, so this is K land, you know? <laughs> Which, uh, as far as uh, we were saying, from what I understand, this is like, oh, okay, general quantum mechanics, we know this. K comes from relativity. And then so it gets integrated kind of forcefully in section two, and then he smooths it out in section four, if that makes sense. Because here, this is again where there's like a lattice, and then they say, okay, well, so if this is, if this is the quantums or the, the space between points in time, we're just gonna take the, we're gonna get it smaller and smaller and, until there's no, until the, the distance is zero. And then we'll say that that's continuous space. <laughs> Which he then says, like, but that doesn't really work. But here's what we find when we do that. And then a lot of what we find in, um, this is, this, I, I'm unclear as to how going back to the harmonic oscillator does anything. It's, I would say it's because in quantum, it's like, that's basically what's going on down in the quantum level all the time. Like, there's like oscillations mm -hmm. in different ways. I think. Yeah. You know, I'm like second year physics dropout. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, well, I, I guess I mean just more in terms of uh, pattern memorization. Uh, like okay. this is where Q shows up, and uh, but K is here, and then Q and K battle it out, and K really ends up winning. Q goes away by the very, very end. Actually, I can show you. I can show you. We make a play. <laughs> Because we have here, uh, yeah, here it's e to the minus i. So k and k pairs up with x, and q pairs up with y. Da -da 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 -da. And then by the end of it, we are just left with k's. Uh, q's seem to disappear, and they don't show up in the second lecture. Um, <laughs> well, they do, but it's like a different variable, and it's like in in like hexagonal brackets. So it means something else. Yeah. Uh, so you, do you kind of see this as a story? Like, I don't know, the way you described it just now made it feel like it had a narrative or... Yeah, well, in order to memorize, I, yeah, very much needed to, like, there's a part uh, here, for instance, like, uh, okay, so the twiddle, twiddle shows up here, I don't know if you heard like five twiddle. That's this like that's this. Uh, Sorry, I'm sure my physics teachers were using a different. Uh, it might be tilde, but he says twiddle, or at least the physicist with whom I, because uh, uh, they gave me the notes and I uh, met up with my friend who connected me, um, Barry, who who like told me. Uh, how to how to pronounce some of the things that didn't have a uh, um, that I didn't know about. So, for instance, that this is referred to as the commutator of the anytime something's in brackets. Um, uh, but yeah, so Twiddle shows up, K shows up, and takes over. And here, I like in my head, and this I just like. Very embarrassing, but it's always like the triumphant return of X. Like finally shows up, the twiddles go away, then it's X again, and it's like yes. Um, because there's something about like twiddle and K, like as far like I was talking about the like in, like I approach it, it's poetry. Um, there's something about those sounds that suddenly when it goes into X, 
It's like, it feels good to, to do that again. And then it also feels like math again, because math is x equals da 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 da, not k and twiddle. So that's my, that's my uh, yeah, personal. Is it some k space somewhere? Yes, uh, that? because... Uh, Volume integral over k space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of the, what we're trying to get to is a volume integral over a real space. K space shows up here, um, two, uh, one over two pi cubed. Um, I couldn't tell you what that means, but it seems to be like shunted in when twiddle shows up and then smoothed out again, like I said, uh, when twiddle goes away. So it's, it's almost like we had to say like, okay, we're inventing this thing, twiddles. Um, we can't have that in real space anymore, so we're gonna have it in K space. And then twiddles in k-space, twiddles in k-space, until we reach, until the triumph of return of x. <laughs> and then, uh, even, even here we're in k-space, uh, here, until we, until we, it is also, finally it is also useful to rewrite equation 53 in terms of the properly normalized annihilation operator, so that the uh, annihilation operator can be expressed in terms of field of canonical momentum density. And then, we're in real, real space for the last two equations. So, it's it still is a function of k, though. Uh, isn't it? Um, a is a function of k. No? Yeah, yes. Uh, it's the, it's a continuum, standard continuum. This, so this is, I'm, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm talking it out as I, as I do it. But here, here's where a of k, uh, shows up, and that's the standard continuum definition of an annihilation operator. So, so there's like a continuum, and then, uh, but I think because it's like, because of these words, properly normalized means real, uh, volume integral of our real space and X, like I ha I can't help but anthropomorphize those terms and like really like when X shows up and be like, oh, okay, here's the twiddle part, blah, 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 you know, but, but that's how I, yeah, narrativize it, and I think that's helped with the memory as well. Mm. Do you think that, um, like you were saying, you know, you made that little vector of mm -hmm. the, uh, the or whatever that mm. shouldn't have been a vector, and yeah. people laughed. Yeah. That those kind of experiences help with the memorizing as well. Yes. Well, I mean, every time I mess up, it's like, oh, I remember this is this is when I made that mistake, and this is when I made that mistake. Which, when I'm learning. Uh, I remember when I'm learning lines for a play, that's how I memorize lines for a play. Is like, I'll go through it and, oh, I messed up that such and such a line. And then the next time I get to that line, I might remember it as, oh, I messed it up that one way, so I don't want to mess it up that other way. Hmm. Um, yeah. Did you have a chance to try it on like some kind of physic barrier or whatever? Yeah, um, yeah, on, on, on them and several, of Professor Alan Gutt's uh, own students uh, who had gone through the course already. So I would do it. And that's really weird too, because they're just watching like, mm-hmm, 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 yep. You know, they, like they read it in this way that, you know, yeah. That we didn't, no? Well, that I don't, and that I, I assume people who don't, who are unfamiliar with it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, and they were kind of like, it's really weird that you can just do that, but you have no, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, wow, like a dog can tie its shoes. Like, that's not supposed to happen, but kind of interesting. I also know how to tie my shoes and better than the dog, you know what I'm saying? So, so, uh, so I was able to, I was able to, to test it out, yeah, on for, for people who, who knew it. Uh, do you write at all? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is it that bad? <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, because did you ever write? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're <laughs> you're <laughs> writing that shit. No. Um, well, because so you're in theater. You do plays. Do you write plays at all, or do you write any like? Oh, uh, no, no, not, uh, not uh, cre creationally. Mm. I'm wondering if you could use this to inform a play that you could write. That describes this narrative in your head. Oh yeah, just with like actors and stage settings and like all this other stuff, and how that oh, like, yeah, interesting that would be to watch a play yeah. inspired by. I'd watch that. I would watch it. Wow. Over it. Yeah, I'm totally <laughs> imagining like X shows back up or like where's K or like okay, go this take this, put it in a box or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And even like, even just a few, just like three or four years ago, um, when Breaking Bad was a bigger thing, like Heisenberg shows up and people know Heisenberg or, you know, that's uh, like, that would be like these, all these historical figures show up. Uh, like Schrodinger shows up, Heisenberg shows up, Fourier shows up, and and like in a way it also tracks the history of physics as well, which I find interesting. Yeah. Um, that isn't uh, emphasized in that class, but I found actually that was one of the only things I could research from this <laughs> script was like script was like oh oh here's Schrodinger I know Schrodinger he he put the cat in the box right <laughs> right. And then, and then, oh, Heisenberg, he makes crystal meth. And, and he <laughs> oh, wait, but it's uncertainty, and so on. So, so I was able to, yeah, track that historically as well. Cool. Well, thanks again for listening. And I'm sorry that uh, Anna Maria couldn't be here, who initially invited me. But, but, but good to meet you all. <laughs> and, and, and to meet Alan, <laughs> Professor Alan Guthrie, I guess. Well, thank so, you. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks for coming.